Alyssa Mushido. How you like Cole? Hello, hello. Welcome to the space. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I'm so excited to dive into this conversation. Um, I know y'all hail from the anthropologists, which we will talk about shortly, but I'm going to throw it over to each of you individually first. Who are you today? I will say that today I am a person who is a little bit more in love with theater after having watched the Tony Awards, uh, reigniting that core uh, theater kid flame inside of me and just ever more excited about storytelling and like the the ability to tell new stories in new ways. I love that. Awesome. Like? <laughs> yeah. So who am I today? I am someone deeply embedded in mother work. <laughs> um, but also looking forward to summertime and relax and self-care. And I would also say that I am, uh, today I'm exploring kind of what creation and making means to me. Um, and like how I can, that can be more present in my life and, and um, like what that means for me. So that's who I am today. <laughs> I love that. How do you two know each other and work together? So Haile and I uh, began our collaboration this past spring when the American Anthropological Association, when they founded a fellowship position uh, so that we could have an anthropologist in residence with my theater company, The Anthropologists. And we're so fortunate that Haile applied for this position and the the stars aligned all the, so much about Haile's work aligned with what we were seeking and just really grateful now to be in a collaboration. And what kind of work do you all do at The Anthropologists? So I am the founding artistic director and uh, primarily I am a director, a playwright, and also a producer. The Anthropologists is dedicated to the collaborative creation of investigative theater that inspires action. So all of our plays are um, built by an ensemble and uh, built on a foundation of research, source material, cultural artifacts. And we bring that uh, research to life through physical theater techniques. And we're really operating as a form of social inquiry where our plays are aiming to uh, provoke conversation and get people looking at uh, whether it's a period of history or a, a something that's happening in the world right now to get it to look at it differently. We just turned 15. Congrats. We have, thank you. We have three guiding questions um, that we've developed over that decade and a half of making work. Uh, definitely didn't start with these questions, but this is what has emerged. Can we use source material to challenge our own assumptions? Can we use research to broaden or break dominant narratives? And can we use archival materials to better understand our present? So those questions, among many other, are always kind of swirling around and they are our like anchor points. Uh, and, you know, while we've always been driven by uh, a process that values research, uh, and rigorous dramaturgy. This is the first time that we've had an anthropologist in the room with us. So it is both a, a gift to get to benefit from Haile's knowledge and also be in conversation about anthropological practices and theater making practices and how do they differ? How do they align? How can Haile's practice inform our work. So we're in the midst of that exploration. Yeah. Um, 
for anybody who's listening who doesn't fully understand the scope of what it means to be an anthropologist or to study anthropology, right? Because I feel like this word is thrown around a little bit in terms of just like our vernacular of how we see the world or what we talk about. And But what is it actually, Hayule? <laughs> I always get this question and it always makes me laugh because um, people will ask like, well, what do you do? And I'll be like, I'm an anthropologist. Mm-hmm. And I get all these really interesting like um, ideas about what that is. So it's like, Correct. do I dig for bones? Um, is it like Indiana Jones? <laughs> like, you know, um, is it you know like is it psychology? Mm-hmm. You know, it's there's always this overlap between these other sort of social science fields. So at its root, um, if you kind of break anthropology, the word down, you know, it's really kind of the study of humans and humanity, right, at its core. And um, although I'm a cultural, sociocultural anthropologist, um, you know, the study of humans, um, anthropology kind of traverses very various different kind of ways of looking at that. So like physical anthropology, um, archaeology does fall under um, anthropology across the board. So looking at kind of, you know, historical material culture, biological anthropology, there's forensic anthropology, and all of these kind of entry points by which we use um, methods to understand humanity. And so as a cultural anthropologist, we look at um, in-depth studies of human culture in various contexts. So that would be like my elevator speech (laughs) Um, for what anthropology is. The the methods have changed and people are exploring like really new innovative ways of doing research and things like that. But like I would say typically our bread and butter would be ethnographic study. So really in-depth um, kind of participant observation, really, of you know, what we call it um, in, a, in the field where you really immerse yourself in a particular culture or context so that you can deeply understand it. Um, so that that's what I would say is like our primary methodology. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's some, you know, wiggle room and flexibility yeah. with that. So. Yeah. Thank you for elaborating um, because now putting these two um, – together, as in the work that y'all are doing at The Anthropologist and the work that you do, Hayule, um, I think we're going to really be able to dissect the value, the exploration, the um, overlap, like w- the way in which this is somehow different than just creating from like one's mind or imagination. Um, I'm super curious, as somebody who has devised work for myself, um, and also in collaboration in grad school and undergrad as well, um, this idea of storytelling from the foundation of real, I say that in large quotations actually, but like research (laughs) and um, artifacts and things that exist um, prior to people just coming together and being like, what about this as a concept and let's create from that. And so I'm curious, what do we call the the stuff that we're using? (laughs) Which I know is like an abstract question, but I feel like in a world where so many people question what is real and so many people question what is truth and so many people question what is fact, where do we even start with accumulating the things and how do we decipher what are we using, uh, what the stuff is? Juicy questions. You know, when when looking back on the work that we've created, we did not necessarily start out making work with a very like academic or rigorously academic definition of research and, and sort of like what constituted legitimate research in part because we were making work about people and places and time that that had not been accurately or adequately captured. Yeah. So we had no choice but to look in unexpected places. For example, a cookbook that happened to have a little anecdote uh, about a, a woman from 1917 or a homemaker's guide or 
in later works like uh, uh, YouTube videos that were posted by garment workers in Egypt. So we had to think broadly and imaginatively about Mm -hmm. what those sources, where those sources could live. Yeah. By the same token, we always try and treat the source material with integrity that we're not um, inventing source Mm -hmm. material, that rather when we do assemble firsthand testimony or secondhand testimony or photographs, et cetera, that we are, we're really mining the source material to see what stories are either right there in plain sight or, or buried a little bit deeper uh, and going, going beyond a surface narrative. Mm -hmm. How do you find these things or how do you know to look there or how do you get curious enough to be open to finding these things in weird places? A lot of curiosity, Mm -hmm. a lot of willingness to go down the rabbit hole, whether that is the the Googling rabbit hole or the JSTOR academic, you know, site or going to the New York Public Library to see like what is actually there in the archives that you wouldn't be able to take out from a bookstore. Um, and just chasing that initial uh, seed, right, of an idea. Uh, that is, you got to have that drive, I think. Mm-hmm. That that's yeah. what has driven us. Yeah. I think the reason I ask about all of this is because as we begin to like get into the weeds about it, I- I've had a lot of questions as of late about the overlap of storytelling, truth, integrity, having oneself be seen in something authentically, honestly while also being able to share something that is not about oneself in a similar vein. Where do we put weight for these things? How do we show up as creatives in a way that is truly empathetic and also recognizing that the human condition is very complicated (laughs) and nuanced? And so for me, this intersection of source material or being curious and having this lens of curiosity to go and mine things that are perhaps hidden is part of learning and unlearning things about ourselves as humans. And so for me, this idea of approaching storytelling from that lens feels like an integral piece of process I wish more of us used. I have so many things going through my head right now, honestly. Um, I mean, I think this is a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's a very difficult question. And and here's why, right? (laughs) So, you know, the earlier question that you posed about like, what is truth? And it made me think about kind of like, old age understandings of research, right? Mm -hmm. So is it valid? Can you replicate it? Are you using the scientific method to kind of uncover these scientific truths and proof and evidence and all these things, right? But we also know that if we look back at the history of science, a lot of these processes and findings and research were not without their biases, right? Right. Like we can't um, separate them from kind of like their historical context, people who were doing the work, you know, Correct. and it it has all these impacts on the research. There is there are numerous examples of research that was considered to be sound science that has now been debunked, right? Yeah. And we see those examples in anthropology when we think about like craniology or like, you know, all of these things that were used to, for example, um, create like racial hierarchies. Like mm-hmm. we're thinking about those examples. And so I think that part of this process that you're talking about, and it's interesting too, I think that we've been talking about it in the anthropologist as well, like some of these same questions, but um, I think it's really a process of asking ourselves key questions to help um, kind of 
get to as much of a truth as we can. And what I mean by that is, you know, there have been numerous examples just in this project where we're like reading an article and then someone's like, who wrote this, you Mm -hmm. know, and this doesn't seem correct. Like we need more context so that we can understand, like, where are the gaps in this like information? And these are, Mm -hmm. you know, from scientific journals, publications or whatever. And yet, even as observers of the research and people who are reading it, the gaps begin to kind of like jump out at us as we're asking these questions. And so um, for me, that's an interesting piece of the connection between research and storytelling, because as we dive into the archive or do the research, there are these gaps Right. That inevitably exists. Right. And I think that even as an anthropologist or a researcher, as we're like writing up things, there's a moment in which we're trying to fill the gaps. And it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily like making up a story, but we have to kind of use the information that we have at our disposal to kind of craft the narrative that we think is jumping out at us from the source material. And Quite frankly, it feels very similar to what the anthropologist theater troupe is trying to do, which has been a fascinating experience for me um, as someone who's like doing the work in the academy and then seeing it happening on the theater side, on the creative side and being like, wow, like there are these similarities, um, Mm -hmm. which is why I think this project is like so amazing. Melissa, I I think you want to maybe like add to that. (laughs) Well, I just, I was just going to say, the the gaps are what is so exciting and that's where we love to play Mm -hmm. and very often in a theatrical context the gaps are where the imagination comes in right right and and where the storytelling comes in still using the the guideposts that the research to date has revealed to us uh and the gaps also are can teach us so many things throughout the process because we're constantly asking okay so what research is missing whose voice hasn't been represented and and also what does that mean for our creative process in terms of who are the artists that are in the room Mm -hmm. who is not in the room why are they not in the room can we get them into the room uh and I think also asking the audience to go along for the ride and encounter the gaps with us and embrace that complexity and ambiguity is, for me, that's a really exciting place to be. Yeah. Ooh, okay. There's so much here that I I want to ask and delve into. Um, Hayley, you talked about these questions that we need to ask when we are delving into material, when we are doing this research, when we are taking a look at these perhaps academic things who wrote them, blah, blah, blah. Are there specific questions that you have found to be the ones that are like non-negotiable, always ask these questions? And then obviously per project, per subject, there are different ones that you would filter in? Yeah. I mean, I think that for me, um, I mean, some of the ones I, I've already mentioned, kind of like, when was this written? Like, what's the context of the piece? Who wrote it? I mean, I think that those, the kind of circumstances that surround the research can really shift and change how the research was done, what the outcomes were, you know? So those questions are really important. And I think too, especially from like, my, although I am an anthropologist, um, my concentration was African diaspora studies. So there's like this training around like, you know, Black studies and things like that. And so there are these other questions about like power and Mm -hmm. like the social conditions and like, you know, surrounding the moment in time, the history. Like, I think you have to kind of take all of those pieces together as you're trying to understand the narrative um, that is being drawn in front of you from this source material. And I think that in the absence of asking yourselves these types of questions, sometimes you can miss like really glaring things that are, that are what I would say maybe quite obvious, (laughs) you know, and sometimes those absences, well, not sometimes, I mean, they can be really egregious and really harmful. And so I think that, um, 
what I found, and I'm not sure if everyone would agree with this, but, you know, I feel like there comes a point where we have to be gentle with ourselves in the sense that, like, we may not get all of our questions answered or that, you know, our our analysis may not be spot on, but by um, going in with a particular kind of toolbox and mm-hmm. tool set to, to do our best to um, ensure that our critical analysis is sharp, <laughs> yeah. I think is a really good starting place. And I think that it helps to avoid some of the things that I think you were kind of hinting at, Jennifer, where you were talking about these moments of like, um, you didn't say fake news, but you know, kind I, of I mean, like, I, I hinted, is, you know, like <laughs> what is truth and can I just yeah. believe this because I think it and, you know, and I think that like having that sort of toolkit um, that supports kind of critical thinking, I think is really important. Um, yeah. yeah, this, this feeds directly into what you were saying, Melissa, about the gaps and how in these gaps is actually the space where the stuff percolates and the questions live and the curiosity really lies. And arguably that's where art that's never been done can be done because it's in those spaces. I'm curious for the process when you find yourself in the gaps of the things and you're like, ooh, we're seeing that these people aren't here. We're seeing that we cannot find these things. Clearly there is some sort of something going on over here. That's information. And that is also helpful. When you discover something, say like that, how do you use that in a critical capacity without losing the creativity? I think you know, certainly we, we have those moments in the devising process, the collective aha moment when we've found something that rewrites the narrative for us a a little bit that reveals something new that we can all say oh oh this is this was never evident before but now we can see how this is at play like all around the story um or even moments when someone has challenged the source material in rehearsal and had a totally, you know, completely different interpretation than I did. It's so exciting to have my assumptions upended that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there have absolutely been shows in which we are pointing to the gaps or the uncertainty uh, that we are questioning the material as we are, you know, in performance. Yeah. It's this kind of it's pedagogical at the same time as as performative. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes that can really work to our advantage. Maybe sometimes mm-hmm. it hasn't. Uh, <laughs> and we just, we try and get better the next time yeah. with the next show. Obviously with devising, it's something that's never been done before. That's the whole point. Do you ever feel that when you've put something up on its feet and you've chosen a lens or you've chosen a direction or you've chosen to focus on said gap here and what we can learn here, you've chosen Mm -hmm. something, that there's guilt around not focusing on something else or recognizing that there was a limit to the process or the capacity for people's research how do you navigate recognizing kind of going back to what you were saying, Hayley, of like, there are going to be these glaring things that maybe you can or cannot answer. And yet in a process like theater, if you have a, I have a show that needs to go on at this point, you have to have something up by then. How do you marry that? We were, we were just speaking about this and it's a conversation that we're going to continue tonight as well, especially when you're in this early stage of devising and just to give, um, maybe just like a little bit more of a definition about devising. Although I think as many people and companies uh, that engage in devised theater, there are that many different definitions For Uh, for, for us. As, as we've been talking about, we start with 
a topic or a body of research, a topic to research, uh, and a provocation, this driving question that is also informing the kind of source material that we're looking for and becomes that uh, anchor point for us to always check back in with. Uh, and we are literally building the show in the devising process as we generate content. So our joke is that the script comes last. Yeah. So not the, the stage manager usually doesn't like hearing that joke, but it's true. <laughs> um, and so as we are right now in the, this early stage of investigation, and yet we are going to be showing, uh, showing the work at some point, yes, we do have to make a decision about what we are going to share with the audience. And, and that's when it just becomes even so much more important about what are our intentions? Like, what are we trying to learn from the audience, especially in the early stages to let us know, oh, we need to keep going down this path or the, the character you know, through line that we thought was so fascinating, nobody actually really cared about that or no one was surprised about that. So it does allow for us to be contemplating, recalculating, and yet you, I don't, I hesitate to say the word lose, but sometimes it does feel like that. Like you lose something once you make a decision to go down yeah. this path here that you've had to let go of an idea that could maybe be fruitful, yeah. uh, but you've had to preference things. Yeah. That's a hard process that I feel like many artists navigate generally of what takes priority in different seasons of one's life or in different seasons of one's creative process. You know, we can all wear many, many hats, but it's like sometimes you are for myself. Like sometimes I'm the actor hat and sometimes I'm the coach hat and sometimes I'm the podcast host hat and sometimes I'm my doggy mommy hat. Like, you know, like what is, mm -hmm. what is taking the priority? And there's always, yeah, a, a loss or a cost in some capacity mm -hmm. to, to making that decision, but we are only human and we only have so much capacity and so, Hayley, I'm curious for you when you're watching this type of creation or when you're seeing people really attempting to bring forth research or really um, going with a very distinctive integrity of trying to storytell, how do you feel from the anthropological perspective of recognizing that there's like always a part of the human condition that is somehow going to be I don't know if the word's like neglected or yeah, the lost or at a cost. Like what is what is our obligation maybe as storytellers in that? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. Um I think for me though, I think it comes back to what I said before, really recognizing our limits and okay. like being okay with that, you know, and knowing Is that it okay? I mean, like, I think that's the thing that I grapple with. Like, is it okay for us? I mean, like, it has to be okay because time, we only have so much of it and things have to get done. And there's also, you have to make a decision at some point. But is that okay that there's something that's going to be compromised or some dynamic or part of history or human conditions that are not going to be elevated? Yeah. I mean, I think that it is okay. okay. I do. Um, only because though, I mean, one, we can't really do much about it because yeah. we have limits. But I also feel like, you know, at least, at least just like watching this process, I'm like, there are hopefully like more opportunities to maybe, you know, explore something one time and explore something else another time. I also think I think what's the most beautiful, to use lack of a better word, like about kind of addressing, especially the type of issue that the anthropologist theater group is like trying to grapple with for this project. I mean, we're talking about a real world experience. We're talking about real historical trauma that still exists today. You know, mm -hmm. like we're talking about people's real lived experiences, right? Um, 
And I think that what's beautiful about like art making is that I feel like it, it has like a ripple effect in a lot of ways too, you know? In what way? So Tell me more about what that is. This is what I would hope would happen for mm-hmm. a project like this, but what we may have to make a very specific, and I say we, you know, I, I, I'm serving a very particular role in this process, but let's say the group makes a, de- makes a creative decision and puts it on the stage. I think that because of the gaps, because of the topic, because of really even the really thoughtful ap- approach that I've seen Melissa and the actors work through, I do think it's inevitable that the audience will have a number of questions. I mm-hmm. think that the show most likely will impact each audience member in a really different way, right? And so each interpretation, each experience of the creative piece then goes out into the world and potentially does something else, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, we have to think about it that way. I also think, and I don't know if this is like going back to another question, but like what I love about creating art from the research perspective is that I think it does work that maybe research, the research that I do can't do. And here's what I mean by that. So as a researcher who also is trying to work with integrity, you know, I might look at my research and say, this is what the data tells me. This is what the evidence tells me. And this is what I don't know. I'm not going to make any leaps. I'm not going to make things up. Like, this is what I see and this is what I don't see, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in a creative space, you're able to do some of the things that Melissa was talking about. So like, these are the gaps and we're going to point to them, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about soundscapes because I'm obsessed with music and sound. And we had this conversation in one of the sessions about when to use sound and when not. So there are circumstances when the silence is loud, Right. Right. So here's a gap. What what work is that? Just pointing to the gap. What is that doing? Yeah. But then I feel like in a creative space, you're able to say, this is a gap. And this is this is maybe what the source material is telling us. And we're going to explore that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that in a creative space, you're able to do that in a really kind of like transformative way that yeah. I think that maybe like, I can't do purely from a research side. Yeah. And it, it's it's almost like, um, it, this is from some Black studies researchers, but like the opportunity to have like a radical imagination, you know, in those yeah. gaps is really powerful. And so, so while we are limited in time and, you know, space and these other things, I think that the power of creation really does allow us to expand much further than ourselves, even in those really um, tough decisions about what we're focusing on. I think the work is able to kind of like travel in a different way Mm -hmm. that I think is a bit, that that kind of helps us be um, more okay with having to make those decisions. At least that's my hope. I don't know, Melissa, what you think about that, but that, that's kind of how I feel about how it plays out. That definitely resonates for me, even just reflecting upon past shows that we've built where the act of the researching and the conversations as an artistic ensemble and this exploration does make changes. It makes changes to us as individuals. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're not going to leave the process looking at the world in the same way. Yeah. Our our eyes are all being opened to sort of different factors and facets. Uh, And so that is gratifying and exciting. Just thinking about how the work lives on through, through the artists Mm -hmm. beyond the scope of the performance. And I'm always hoping that the performance does not end when we have the curtain call, right? right? Or when lights come up and the audience leaves, I want them to be bothered by what they've seen or excited yeah. and to want to know more. Uh, something else that came up for me, I think in terms of, you know, making the choices uh, and it's, this is just thinking about when we, when we do think about what we're putting on stage in those choices, and and how we're utilizing the source material is are we are we perpetuating harm right and i think that is 
potentially a bigger uh, or like a, a more useful question for us to ask. Because I feel it too, Jennifer, of like, I just, I need a little more time. I need two more weeks of rehearsal. I, I need yeah. another grant so that we can keep going. And there's always going to be creative sparks that we can't fan into flames, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then if we can also look at the work that we are putting out and making sure that we're not uh, making harmful choices with our interpretation, that... Yeah has become a really critical question for us as we're making making these plays. Yeah. It makes me think about impact, like intent versus impact. And you could have incredible intentions around something and still your impact is harming people. And, you know, this is a larger question about like human beings really, but also like our responsibility with art in telling stories that have perhaps never been told before or seen in this light. Um, and it also makes me think about art being subjective, right? Like that is the whole point. The painter who like made that white painting, that painting fills me with, when I say anger and rage that I don't know anywhere else in my body, I'm like visceral rage. And people are like, well, they were the first one who did it and tried to monetize it. And it's like, I understand that. But for me, like, how is that like art in that for me is maybe like the, the F you statement of like, I was the first one versus like, this is me literally knowing this craft in and out. And I don't know why it makes me so mad, but it, there's a room in the Dia Beacon I actually don't know if it's still there, but like, it's just a bunch of white paintings. And I was like, I need to walk out. Like, this is not filling me with any. You're, you're making me think of the, the, the play by Yasmina Reza yes. called Art. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Which yeah. totally it's, taps into that range. But it's that question too, right? Like what we're making what is, is subjective or what is our responsibility or what is art, right? And so this idea that we are creating these things and they're coming out into the world, especially when you're devising work, and you have a responsibility to the research that you've been using to then shed light onto that. And arguably, many people will have many different feelings as they walk out, as they should, because we're all human beings with different life experiences coming into this experience from different places, right? But I think for me, as I'm hearing you both talk about it in this way, it's recognizing that as long as one's intention is truly about lifting something off the page with as much care and attention towards not causing more harm as much as possible in a way that remains open and curious to the understanding that there are probably things that still need to be sussed out, explored, analyzed, that perhaps in another iteration, these questions now need to be answered. And doing so in a way that doesn't feel final, which I would imagine is the whole point of being an anthropologist too, of like nothing is ever complete because you're always going to be discovering more and adding more into one's research to then continue expanding what people know about a topic, you know? Uh, you, you know, you made me think of the word additive, that, the, that we're engaged in an additive pursuit, that yeah. if we didn't get to tell every story that we wanted to in this first draft of the show, or even in the final draft of this particular show, that the aim is we will have an opportunity to reveal the next story yeah. and continue adding to the dialogue. And even if it's not you, perhaps somebody else in the audience is like, oh, this mm -hmm. I never thought about it this way. Let me, and then as you were saying, Hayile, about like the ripple effect of it, where yes, it lives on in the artists who have created it and the people who are in the room and the responsibility of art, if we're going back to like responsibility, is for us to continue engaging in the conversation, hopefully beyond the scope of what you see just in the short period of time that you are engaging directly with the art. Absolutely. I do agree with that. There is one thing, though, I'm, it, this, I think, is a question for yeah. you two in some ways, because I think that, I don't know, I think it's a slippery slope, too, between being like, well, if my intent is good and I'm going through these processes where I'm asking these questions, then it's yeah. all good. And I think that what's potentially missing from that, that maybe 
we should call out is like, what does accountability look like and yes. responsibility? You know, and so I know what that looks like from a research standpoint, but from an artistic standpoint, where, as you said, like everything's subjective and like, like, how do you grapple with accountability? Yeah. Maybe you did everything you thought was right and you still cause harm, you know, and yeah. how do you, what does accountability, accountability look like in a creative space? Mm -hmm. I think is for me, y'all might have answers. I'm very curious to hear what that looks like, but I think that that's a piece that's also really important. Yeah. So that those conversations don't get shut down because, well, I thought I did everything that I should have done. And I really was acting from a place of integrity and thoughtfulness or whatever. What's the mechanism for accountability in yeah. that in that process? I think that's kind of what I was asking earlier. And you said it in a far more eloquent way about like the guilt in it. You know, it's like when you've decided to go down this path and things, whatever comes up, like how do you sit with the guilt? But I think accountability is a better word. Just to acknowledge that this is a hugely important question for the, if I, if I may, for the American theater field at large. Uh, uh, and I, it would behoove us to find some really clear answers. I don't know right now I mean, I appreciate the question. And, and right now I'm thinking, I don't know that I have a model for that. Well, I don't think it's built. I think that's part of the problem. It's like it's not built into the systems that are currently in place that we have in any capacity for any of it. This is the next big question to be, yeah. to be grappling with. Um, certainly different ways that we've approached things in – within the anthropologist. And I'm sure there have been times in throughout our 15 year history that we have unintentionally caused harm. Uh, in a, a more recent creative process, we brought in an outside facilitator who knew the work of the company but didn't um, wasn't part of the creative process at that time um, for that particular show and had a listening session with me not being a part of it, me as director slash artistic director and giving space to the artist to sort of name if anything wasn't sitting well with them in a in the process, both as process and as you know the art that was starting to emerge uh, and also have a hopefully a, a safer space than had I been there for that conversation to sort of name their concerns about the, how source material was being used or what was missing. Uh, and I'm very grateful that we were able to engage in that process. And the outcomes of the conversation were shared with me. And that has, again, like shifted, um, further informed how we engage in research and investigation now. So I think I, I have to remain open to learning something new with every process that we engage in and all the steps along the way. Yeah. I think as, as I was listening to you speak and also just like thinking about that word accountability, for me, it's a lot of recognizing that I know really nothing. <laughs> For myself, you know, I like I and that I will mess up a lot and that as long as I can own when I mess up and the impact that that might happen on an individual scale rather than like an, you know, industry scope of things and take accountability where I can for my mistakes and the apologies or the rescinding or the intentionally like putting myself in spaces to learn more and learn from others who know more than I do. I think there's a matter for me, it's about um, constantly checking myself and my biases of which every single human being has um, and owning my lived experience as its own thing and not projecting that as much as I possibly can onto other people and holding space for other lived experiences and other human beings. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't have all the answers. And the more I continue learning, the more I realize I literally know absolutely nothing. And 
continually, continuously trying to learn and unlearn is, I don't know, I guess at the moment, my form of accountability for myself, at least. That that word unlearn, I feel like that has been one of our driving forces yeah. as a theater company that started with this idea of unlearning history. Yeah. The first show we ever did before we officially became the anthropologist was a show where we were really taking a closer look at Christopher Columbus and looking at his diaries and, and writings of his contemporaries. Mm. This is back in 2007 or so. And it, and it was about like unlearning the history that we'd all been taught as yeah. um, American school children. Uh, and I think the other thing that's coming up for me is this idea of agency. Yeah. And that was another founding impetus for the company that here I was working with all these incredible um, women artists, women actors, and not seeing places for them to be on stage or not seeing places that were compelling and dynamic and complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was why we wanted to start making our own work and in our own way, in our own space, rewriting histories and, and bringing new histories to the stage that hadn't already been played out. Uh, so I think starting from that place of performers having agency, performers being able to craft their own character, yeah. being able to have input into a show has, has then extended itself beyond that as, you know, full individuals engaged in an artistic process. And hopefully with each show, we're getting better at creating the circumstances for artists to have agency in a process to name when um, there are concerns about how we're treating source material or interpreting source material or how we are um, in a cre engaged in a creative process. And I think the other piece of accountability it comes through action. Like I'm thinking about our motto where art meets action that was born out of a desire for the audience to be provoked to action after the show. Mm -hmm. It also means that every time we learn something about our process during the creation of a show that we, especially the times that we learn that we haven't done something well, or that there has been harm caused, that there's an action associated with that, that there is a, a very tangible change to the process, to our policies as theater, as a theater company. Um, and that, that, that being another measure of and, and a potential space for accountability. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, a lot of, I guess the phrase would be like lip service. You know, it's like during certain months that, you know, corporations decide to come out and just be like, we do these things or we, we stand by these things. And it's like, when are you doing this for the other 11 months of the year? And how are you integrating the, this into your workplace environment? And how are you holding yourselves accountable? I'm really grateful to at least name that um, from a social responsibility perspective um, mm. that as we create as we step into spaces where we are creating, whether it's in a devising space or taking somebody else's already done work and putting it into our bodies to storytell, um, that the idea of action and responsibility not just being accountable internally but also externally um, is something that I love naming. So thank you for that. As we begin winding down our time, is there anything that is on both of your hearts that you want to share? I think for me coming into this space and I, like I'm very strange in that I don't call myself an artist necessarily, but I have, mm -hmm. you know, performed over the years and, you know, do make art, you know, yeah. for whatever reason. And, um, but it has been such a wonderful experience working with the theater troupe. And I think it just reiterated for me the power of art for change, yeah. whether that's, you know, systemic change or, you know, to share information or to change hearts. Like, and this is something that I know. I mean, we can look 
pass in time and see um, the centrality of art to like social movements and all of these things. Like this is what, yeah. you know, we know, but, um, you know, talking about the topic that the play is talking about and seeing the process, I just, I just feel really passionate about the transformative power of art yeah. um, to tell stories that have a real impact. And I just, um, I think it's really important that we have a number of ways to interact and engage and um, like understand the world around us. And I think that art is key to that. And so that's been really heavy on my heart. And like I said, it just was kind of like glaring at me being in this process. Um, and it's just been amazing. So that's the thing that I would share. I appreciate hearing that so much. And I'm thinking about um, how restorative it has felt to be in a rehearsal studio with the dynamic group of artists that we've assembled for this project, especially three years into the pandemic, which I now I know now isn't considered a pandemic, but we're obviously like still very much feeling the ramifications of that. And when it feels really challenging to continue making theater from a producing point of view, logistical point of view. And it, there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes on to mm-hmm. like make this work possible. Every time I get into space with other artists, I'm just like, it, so I feel lighter. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful too, that the artists are coming together and um, really working in a vulnerable uh, space that makes that transformation possible. And so it will be the the challenge, but the excitement of being able to then share that with an audience. Yeah. Um, thank you for going on this journey with me. Uh, thank you for being brave enough to like tackle these really large words that get thrown around that I think are important for us to name and begin to engage with. Um, For anybody who wants to support the work of the theater, for anybody who wants to get in touch with either of you, um, we can go one at a time, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, collaboration, questions, further understanding what is the best way within both of your boundaries to reach out and um, work, collaborate, and all the above. Well, I'll just say that you can find out more information about The Anthropologists at theanthropologists.org. And um, I think we buried the lead in that the play that we're currently working on is uh looking at the deep history of midwifery in the United States and also uh, maternal health outcomes and inequities. Uh, That play is currently called Axes, Herbs, and Satchels. Uh, And we are, yeah, we're on the beginning of that journey and we'll have opportunities um, to be sharing that outside of the rehearsal room very soon. So you can find us at our website and on Instagram and Facebook, and occasionally Twitter for now, and Patreon. If you're intrigued by this work and you think it sounds valuable, you can become a Patreon subscriber. You can go to my website, hayelecole.com. That's probably the easiest. There's like a contact form. It'll come to my email. Learn about the work that I've done. I even have some of my art stuff on there, my photography is on my website. Yes. Um, that's just my little side thing for fun. But um, yeah, you can contact me through there. I am on Instagram, but you don't have to contact. It's probably easiest through the website. <laughs> Thank you both so, so, so much for your time and for this exploration and for the work that you're doing. Um, I think it's really valuable to be dissecting and looking deeper and going to the research and being curious and telling stories um, in ways that have not been done before. Um, So thank you for going on this journey with me. Thank you for inviting this conversation. 